Well, at the end of our, our last uh, class, you know, we, we really were talking about some very uh, complicated uh, issues. And, and we're, we're talking about the issue of diagnosis. And the reason why, you know, I took you through, uh, and, and actually we didn't even cover as much complexity as there is in the diagnosis of depression, but it's, it's so you can understand that the field is constantly striving to be more precise. But, you know, the very nature of, of working with human problems is such that it's, it's very difficult uh, to put people in the categories. In some ways, that, that's probably a very good thing. Uh, you know, it, we have to constantly be reminded that each of us is unique. But if we're, we're going to study problems, we do have to find ways to kind of categorize, categorize certain groups. And in many ways, that's what diagnosis is all about. Uh, but as, as you can see, uh, people who know a lot about uh, an area, in the case we described depression, will have legitimate differences about what is necessary in order for someone to be put in one category versus another. And there will be legitimate differences around issues like how long do you have to be this way before one would actually want to put a label on you, like uh, you, know, you have a depressive disorder. <laughs> And as soon as you do things like that, uh, it becomes artificial. I mean, to say that you have to have a condition for two years before you use a certain diagnosis when, you know, I mean, anybody can logically say, you know, what, what if you've had it for, you know, a year and eight months? I mean, that seems long enough. Uh, or the, in some cases, you have to have something for two weeks. Well, you know, why not 10 days? Uh, so, when you, you look back at your notes and you look back at uh, various diagnostic indicators, you realize that th these simply are the attempts by scientists uh, and clinicians to meaningfully group certain people so that we can kind of study those phenomena. And obviously, the real intention is to be able to examine treatments for these problems and to compare the treatments so we can see whether they're effective or not. Now, today, we're going to move on and talk about in interviewing. And uh, what you need to, uh, to be aware of is that of necessity, you know, we talked about assessment. Now we're going to talk about interviewing. We are going to repeat some things, uh, but we're going to try to look at it now from the perspective of what a person does who is doing the interviewing, uh, what the experience is like in the interview, but then some of the things we discussed under assessment will next actually come up as part of the interview process. Now certainly the, the most frequent thing probably any clinical psychologist does is to interview a person. And these interviews can be for a, a wide range of problems. Uh, most common, uh, I would certainly think though, is assessing someone for a mental health treatment. Now the client comes to the psychologist with what is called a presenting problem. And this is the reason why the person has come. And the presenting problem, uh, in, in asking the presenting problem, the clinical psychologist is really attempting to understand, uh, first of all, the nature of what it is that troubles someone, what are the components of the problem, and then this leads to the person trying to determine what interventions or single intervention might be successful in helping with the problem. Now, kind of regardless of the setting, initial interviews uh, may have more or less requirements. And we'll begin with interviews that, that take place in a, a psychological clinic uh, or a community mental health center or hospital kind of setting. The first question that directors of clinics want psychologists to determine is fairly logical. It's, why is this person here? Thus, the, the presenting complaint is often listed very early in the report. So you identify quickly, this is why the person has said he or she is coming. And, and certainly, if you're the interviewer, uh, you want to determine that as early as possible so you understand the kinds of questions you might want to ask. Now after that, there are a number of questions about the presenting complaint 
including the duration of the problem. And of course, you know, duration becomes very important because you want to know, are we dealing with an acute or are we dealing with a chronic problem? And also you want to determine why is the person presenting now? Uh, often you know, that can be very meaningful. That is, and you'll see as we go on that uh, the person may be presenting now only because the person's being pressured to. Then you want to know the symptoms that are associated with the problem. And, and not only do you, you know, want the symptoms, but you want to know how are they manifested. You know, for example, if the person comes in and, and announces that he or she is depressed, uh, you want to observe, you know, does the person cry or, or have they reported they've been crying? Uh, are they withdrawn? Do they say that they, they get angry? Do you notice that they refer to themselves very depreciatingly? Uh, do they complain of a lack of energy? Uh, do they tell you that they sleep more? <coughs> or do they tell you that uh, they've noticed that their sleep is very agitated? Or even that their partner has told them that they are very agitated when they're asleep? Do they report eating more or eating less? Uh, do they indicate that they can't concentrate so they're not getting done the things they're supposed to get done? But there, there are lots of <coughs> symptoms that may be associated with the problem. So you don't just want to know the problem, but you want to determine to the extent you can, how does this problem manifest itself? Then of course you want to know has there been any previous treatment uh, for this problem? And that's key because if you are dealing with a chronic problem, it's very helpful to know, has the person sought help before? And if something that occurred in that treatment was helpful, you would want to know that. And obviously you would want to know if the person has tried certain things before uh, and they didn't work. So that you don't put the person back into a situation where the individual will anticipate failure. So if the person says, for example, you know, I was treated in group therapy before, really didn't help me very much, you don't want to start thinking, well, it, even though on the surface the person might look like a good candidate for group, you don't want to start thinking right away you're going to do that because it might be sending a message to the, the patient uh, that the patient uh, really is not going to have any say in this. And obviously, uh, one of the things you want to work on is developing collaboration with someone. You also want to know that the, the personal energy that the client appears to be willing to devote to the problem. Uh, and that becomes important, uh, as I just mentioned a moment ago, because you know some people come to, uh, to seek uh, therapy, come to seek help, because they really are in distress. And, uh, and they realize it's time for me to talk to a professional. I, I'm, I am just not making it by myself, and I need the assistance of this. But there are other people that get referred because there's pressures on them. For instance, their, perhaps their boss at work has said, if, if you don't go and get some help, I'm afraid I'm going to have to let you go. So the person may be in front of you not terribly motivated. Uh, they may be quite depressed, but their motivation for being there is to save their job, and they have some kind of faint awareness that if they're going to save their job, uh, perhaps they should be in treatment. But you know, you have to assess: Are they going to devote enough energy to this that uh, actually, you know, they can get better? And and along with that, then you also want to determine that even the person's capacity for cooperating with treatment. Uh, there you know, are, are some disorders where you have to be very careful to assess, is it reasonable that this particular person could benefit from treatment, uh, the kind of treatment that you have to offer? Uh, some examples are, uh, if you're dealing with somebody who is, uh, is drug dependent and, uh, and you're, the resources you have are to treat the person as an outpatient, yet the person is going to continue to live with several other people, all of whom are drug dependent and actively using drugs. 
and the person is going to return to a community where drugs are, are readily available, uh, is this person going to be strong enough in that setting to be able to really overcome their drug habit? Or do you have to start thinking about uh, getting this person relocated, uh, perhaps to a halfway house, maybe even an inpatient facility, but to some place where there's hope that the person is not so surrounded by a milieu that encourages the pathology that your ability in, in, in treatment to intervene probably w won't be successful. Uh, some of the same things happens with some people who have had serious eating disorders. Uh, unless you actually can put them into a controlled environment, which often is a hospital, and work with them for a period of time, the people just can't overcome uh, the intensity of their impulses to eat. So the interviewer then is in this position not only of listening to the presenting complaint, uh, but really trying to assess uh, just who is this person before me? How complex is the problem? How does it manifest itself? And do I have somebody who is really motivated enough uh, to, to treat? And are the external circumstances such that this is possible? Now, if the presenting problem is associated, uh, for example, with a medical problem, then you take a history of the illness. Uh, and you also take a history of the treatment uh, of the illness. So you want to know, for example, well, let me start off by saying this can be very complex. Uh, this is not a simple history to take. Uh, supposing the person presents with depression, but the depression follows cardiac bypass surgery. And the individual may be saying that they can no longer work effectively. Uh, that they, they just don't have the energy uh, to work. Now, if that's the case, it becomes very important for the interviewer to determine whether the depression is, is actually a result of poor cardiac function. That is, that's why the person is so listless, they don't have any energy, actually their heart is not working very well. Uh, or, whether the individual was so traumatized by having heart surgery that they, they currently live in fear of a repeat of some traumatic event occurring uh, in which their heart will become functionless. You know, two very different views. I mean, one, you have a very physiological situation in which this person is not recovering well from heart surgery. The surgery hasn't been that effective. And, uh, and, and their depression really may have a lot of physiological base on the other hand, and the, and the other hand, by the way, is the most common, uh, the surgery was fine. Uh, the, the person should recover and should not have any kind of real difficulty, but the person is so traumatized that that's taking all their energy. Now, I can tell you that uh, I have observed in people that, uh, that heart surgeries uh, cause some very, very traumatic things for people. I, when I was preparing this, I was thinking of two friends of mine, one of whom is a, a clinical psychologist, the other a psychiatrist, both very senior people. And this was a number of years ago, but each of them had cardiac bypass surgery. And I remember going to visit them in the hospital. And their surgeries, by medical standards, have been very successful. And clearly they were going to recover. And I, and I remember, uh, you know, asking them how they felt, uh, you know, recovering. And both of them responded almost identically. And I, I personally was very surprised because both of them told me if I had to have a second bypass surgery, I wouldn't do it. Now, you know, this is, is life-saving surgery. I mean, if you don't have the surgery, you will die. And, and I was struck by the fact that here are two very psychologically sophisticated people. Uh, and they're older. Uh, they've, they've seen people who have had these kinds of problems before. I mean, they're very familiar with this. In spite of all of that, each of these persons was so traumatized by the surgery that they were already saying things. And they were saying it to somebody they knew well, but still they were saying, you know, I would choose to die before I would do this again. And 
it, it really helped me to become much more sensitive to the fact that, you know, things that we think of uh, as routine surgery, uh, as routine life experiences maybe, are only routine if it's happening to somebody else. But if it's happening to you, uh, things change it dramatically. And, and this is also one of those cases where being an expert, uh, really knowing about trauma like this, may not necessarily keep you, uh, in fact, obviously doesn't keep you, from having those very traumatic feelings, those very painful feelings. And so a, as an interviewer, you don't ever want to let yourself get into the position of thinking that this is another such and such. Uh, that is, this is routine. Instead, you want to be aware uh, you have to listen for how this particular individual is experiencing this problem. Now, now next then, in many theoretical systems, a thorough family history is taken. And this means asking the individual about, uh, often may start asking them about their earliest memories. Uh, I think I've mentioned previously, sometimes it's more important just to know if people have memories than uh, necessarily what the content is, but the content can be important. You want to know the type of home in which they were raised, uh, and, uh, and that, that can differ greatly. I mean, some people have been raised in a, a traditional home. More and more in our world right now, people are not being raised in traditional homes, so you want to listen for what is the environment like. Were they raised by two parents? Were they raised by a single parent? Were they raised in a blended family where they had a parent and a step-parent? Uh, were there uh, siblings? And were there siblings from both uh, marriages? Uh, how did they feel about all that? At what age did those kinds of things occur? Then you also want to know, were there significant traumas earlier in their life? And, and it's very important that you listen to the person's description of, of a trauma and not assume that their trauma or their experience might be like yours. For example, you want to know about the death of a grandparent or a parent or a sibling or a close relative or a nanny or you know, someone very significant. Now, if you're the interviewer and you lost such a person and you resolved it pretty well. well. I mean, your parents knew that you were upset over the fact that, that grandma who lived in the home died and they took great care to let you mourn and, they, and you had a lot of support. You got through it. Then you can say, well, you know, it's, it's very difficult for someone to have a person die, uh, but you can get through it. Well, that was you. But you may be interviewing someone where there was a loss of, of a grandparent who actually had become the real parent who had been the real nurturer and caregiver to the person. And no one let this, this person mourn this. I mean, in fact, this is a very unresolved death in this person's life, even though it happened 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, so you always want to listen for what did this person experience and not get caught in, and this is a, a problem always for us when we're, we're doing interviews, is not try to liken it either to our own experiences or to experiences of the majority of clients you've seen. You also want to know, you ask the person, how did they adjust to school? And if you think about this, of course, I mean, since you yourselves are now still in school, I mean, think of how much of your life is actually devoted to school. And it's always amazing that, uh, in, you know, in some <coughs> clinicians gather very little data about school or about the experience of school. When in reality, uh, that makes up a huge part of a person's developmental life. You also want to know what kind of friendships a, a person has. Uh, obviously, the first important thing is to you know, get a feel, does the, has the person had friendships? Uh, were the friendships meaningful? Uh, did they last? Uh, were they rewarding for the person? Or are, are friendships an area that are filled with trauma? Then you want to know when did the person have their first sexual experience and how they felt about it. And there are certain things that uh, you pick up. Sometimes when you ask someone, you know, tell me about your first sexual experience. Uh, what you see right away is anxiety. So you know you've, you've gotten into an area uh, that's difficult for the person. Uh, but you may get, you know, all kinds of responses. 
you make it, someone's saying, gee, I don't, I don't really remember a lot about it. Well, uh, there's a real clue to you uh, that, you know, here's a very significant life event. They don't remember much about it. They're also telling you, I don't really want to talk about this. Uh, so if it's a first interview, you, you might do this very delicately, and you might even choose, if you saw too much anxiety, to just move on to something else and feel, uh, this is probably not something that we should explore right now. Uh, you want to know if the person's employed, if that's something you would expect of them. And importantly, you want to get a sense of, do they enjoy the work they're doing? Again, uh, along with school, I mean, work takes up a great deal of our lives. So if somebody is working and they report to you that they enjoy it, that is a very important bit of information, as is someone tells you they don't enjoy their work. Because obviously the next question is to uh, you know, determine whether you think they're not enjoying the work because of something they're doing or not doing, or whether they are in circumstances where nobody could enjoy that job. And of course, if it's the latter, then you also want to try to determine, is the person trying to do something to change those circumstances? Then, uh, if the person is married or in a meaningful relationship, uh, you certainly want to know, is the relationship productive? Uh, and you also want to know, are there concomitant problems in the relationship that might affect the presenting problem? So that uh, you, you always want to, to look for what is really going on interactionally, uh, interpersonally, socially with someone that either might serve as a means of support in helping the person to overcome a problem, or is it the case that they're in a situation where uh, this is probably really contributing to the problem? Now, after I've put all this emphasis then on that the first thing you want to know is the presenting problem. And, and you gather a lot of data to try to understand it. You also want to be aware it might not be the focus of treatment. Uh, if we go back to our person who actually comes in with depression after bypass surgery, uh, the person could be depressed for reasons other than the surgery. For example, I think I may have used this example before, but it's a potent one. If the person who underwent heart surgery lost a parent at about the same age as they are undergoing the surgery, and the person died, let's say, of a heart attack. So there's a real relationship. The person is 52 years old. They're about to undergo heart bypass surgery. Their father died at age 52 uh, from a heart attack. Uh, now, that may cause someone to anticipate that they're going to die. That is, uh, in fact, it is an important phenomenon. People often do pay very close attention uh, to when their parents died if their parents died young. Uh, sometimes it's even more intense if their grandparents also died about the same age. And people begin to worry when they get to that age that perhaps it's time and I'm going to die. And, uh, and that, by the way, also is something that people often don't share. So it, it's kind of just kept inside themselves. It can create intense worry, but they really don't tell anybody about it. Uh, but they're living in fear, essentially, that they are going to die. Now, in some cases, people who have no heart problems, that is, they have no real heart problem, but they'll develop an intense depression uh, because they have this fear of death and, and they're worried that, uh, that they, will, uh, have that, uh, they, they will have a heart problem and that it will take their life. That's in spite of the fact that either a physician has examined them, if, if they've undergone cardiac bypass surgery, then obviously they've been examined, the physician has talked to them, and the physician's probably come back and reported the surgery was very successful. Uh, and if you're a physician, uh, especially if you're a surgeon, and you have to do a lot of these, and this one went really well, I mean, and every indicator is that uh, this person will be fine, it's usually not the case that the person then spends a lot of time with the individual who underwent the surgery. 
So if we have a person like I'm describing, no one may take uh, a lot of time to pay attention to the fact that even though this has been very successful, this person may not experience it as having been very successful. Now, you can also have the same situation happen when there's, there's no such thing as, as heart surgery. That is, the person simply gets to a certain age. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why it's important to find out about when uh, parents uh, died, if that has happened. Because if you realize this person is about the same age as that parent, it wouldn't be surprising. And, and by the way, if this is someone who's never been in treatment before, it wouldn't be surprising that this person is really coming in because they're very traumatized over what for them is an existential event. That is, they are anticipating they may die. And so the presenting problem that I'm feeling depressed is not really the issue. The real issue is that this person has an anticipation that their life will end soon. Now, if the person presents with depression, of course, there are also other possibilities that you have to be aware of. Uh, a person uh, may fear that they've become unattractive and that their partner is losing interest in them. And so they become depressed uh, as a means of kind of get a, getting identified as a patient. Uh, it allows them to be more passive. And they hope that <coughs> their partner, whom they feel they are, are, they're not being a good partner to that person anymore, but they feel the partner will take care of me. And, and that means the partner will not leave. And so you may have a depression uh, where the symptoms are fairly unimportant in a way. That is, alleviating the symptoms won't help the problem. Because the problem is this person now feels that they're, they're failing in their relationship. And, and that, again, can be very complex. I mean, you really have to, to examine carefully what is going wrong in, in this relationship now that causes this person to feel this way when apparently they haven't felt that way before. Now, there are even further complexities to what you would have to look for as you're the interviewer and you have this person who's come in presenting as being depressed. And, uh, and when you ask these questions, for example, about uh, when parents died, what are the things you may find out is that the person is still very angry with that parent for dying. Uh, that's a hard thing for, for young people. If, if you have a parent who dies uh, you know, when you're quite young, and everybody talks about how wonderful the parent was, and how you should almost kind of like pay homage to that person, it's very difficult for a young person then to get out the rage that they feel towards that parent the parent abandoned them. The parent went and died. It is not unusual to feel angry. Very importantly, and, and sadly, it's not unusual the person never gets to express the anger because the family only allows a certain kind of mourning. Uh, the anger also could be that the person is now upset because he or she feels very vulnerable. So I say they've gotten to about the same age that this event happened uh, to a parent. And so now they're worrying it's going to happen to them, only what they're feeling is anger. They're, they're angry they're in this situation. And if they are feeling angry, it, it can take on you know, kind of irrational uh, proportions. For instance, they can get very angry with their, their partner, uh, their loved one, because that per they feel that person's not doing enough. Now, and so they may start showing a lot of anger towards the loved one. The loved one has no idea why all of a sudden we're arguing all the time. And you have to remember that this can occur in such a way, it, that a lot of it is unconscious, so that our person who is now presenting as being very depressed and having episodes of anger uh, has never told the partner that they're very angry with the parent uh, who died that they're very frightened, that they themselves are now vulnerable, and that they want their partner to be more supportive. And so the partner doesn't even realize that there's this expectation, but what they do realize is the person's getting angry with them all the time. Now, as you can see then, what 
might appear to be you know, a, a simple uh, question, like let's find out what the presenting problem is, and then let's gather some history uh, on this person, actually can get very complex as you move along, depending on what you observe. So you, you always want to be very careful to be watching the person when you ask certain questions to see, uh, does it elicit you know, uh, facial signs, or uh, does the person move around in their seat, or does the person uh, look away, or does the person show any number of symptoms that would tell you that what we have just brought up is upsetting to this person. We probably ought to explore it a little more. Now, there also are other data that are gathered uh, during an interview. For example, uh, if, if you're in a clinic where a DSM-4 diagnosis is required, or if the person is even seeing you privately, but uh, you're going to use insurance, then it's important to ask questions that would permit you to accurately diagnose uh, the person, because you're going to have to use that diagnosis. Now, in emergency rooms, uh, it's common to administer what is called a mental status examination. And by the way, uh, you'll see this on, on page 130 of your text. There's a table, 4.1. And it gives you the material that is most commonly found in a mental status examination. Now, a mental status examination is, is a fairly gross kind of, uh, of interview to get some indicators uh, you know, in a, in a very uh, intense situation as to how someone is functioning. And one of the reasons why it's used so often in an emergency room is people don't tend to come to emergency rooms unless there's a fairly acute problem. So you want to find out just how acute is it. You'll find the, the first thing you, know, you, you do is you just look at the person's general appearance and their behavior, uh, how they react to the interviewer. Uh, you, you pay attention to their grooming and, and to the clothes they're wearing. Uh, is this somebody who comes in and uh, is fairly articulate, uh, which often is not the case in an emergency room. Often the person has a hard time talking about their problem. It's not uncommon that people look very slovenly, uh, that they uh, seem to be falling apart. And, uh, but you want to get a picture of just you know, how much, in a way, like how much ego strength do you think this person has? Uh, how distressed is this person? And just looking at them will tell you something. Then you want to know about their, their speech and their thought. Uh, you know, is their speech coherent? Are they understandable? And, uh, and one of the things you look for are delusions. When, when you start asking this person about, you know, what their, the reason they're there, uh, you know, if the person comes back and says, first of all, I look this way, and I look this way, and they say, I think the FBI has followed me here. Well, a tremendous amount of information. Uh, and you can be absolutely certain that you don't have to check whether the FBI uh, followed them there. You have a delusional person in front of you. Uh, and, and, and that's important because often that tells you the person probably belongs in the emergency room. And it may be that already you're beginning to think now that hospitalization may be necessary. Uh, you always want to get a sense of the person's mood. Uh, is the person anxious? Is the person restless? Uh, is their affect appropriate to the situation? So that, you know, if the person is talking to you and the person is smiling all the time, you know there is something wrong. You don't go to emergency rooms to smile. And if you're being examined in an emergency room by a psychologist or a psychiatric nurse or a psychiatrist, uh, or a social worker, or whoever happens to be the examiner there, uh, that's a very serious business. So if someone's sitting there smiling most of the time, what you realize is they're very frightened. They're probably not telling you a lot of things that you need to know. Uh, but the signal to you as an interviewer is if somebody needs to smile like this, I should be very cautious. I should be very careful because I have a very delicate person in front of me. Uh, then you also, you know, I mentioned before about the person having delusions, but also you do check to see 
if the person has hallucinations. That's usually part of a mental status exam, and, and it's usually somewhat easy to determine in the sense that you ask the person questions like, have you had any unusual experiences? And people who are psychotic often quickly reveal things, like that they do hear voices. And so you, you begin to realize that this is acute, uh, and, and most often uh, hallucinations are acute, that is that someone is not in that state all the time. So that may be part of the reason for why uh, they've been brought in. However, there are further things. You, you, you want to know their orientation. That is, are they aware of, of, of what time it is? Are they aware of where they are? Do they know who they are? And you get people who are so disoriented, they really can't account for these things. Now, once you find disorientation, uh, you often check to see like, what kind of memory do they have. Do they have short-term memory? Do they have long-term memory? Uh, can they tell you events accurately? Uh, you may test them even by, uh, to see if they can concentrate. Uh, a common one is asking people like to count backwards uh, by sevens. Like you might tell them, count from 84 to 49 by sevens and see if they can, can do that. Uh, people who can't concentrate, of course, just can't do that. Uh, people who are, uh, certainly have brain disorders uh, often can't do that. Uh, people with other kind of traumatic episodes can't do that. Uh, also, you may have seen this, uh, for some reason, on, on television when they're showing you ERs, they often do this. But you ask the person, you know, who is the president? Or who is the mayor? Uh, or what are some big cities in the United States? Often people can't tell you that. Uh, and it may tell you then that not only is this individual you're looking at who perhaps is hallucinatory and delusional, uh, but this person is very impoverished. And they, they just, their world is all inside them. And they have no idea of just the usual kinds of things. They really can't identify who is the president. Uh, now, when this is being asked, th these questions are not being asked only because um, you want to see what kind of psychological difficulty the person has. There are always possibilities that uh, drugs are causing this. That is that somebody either is having a bad drug reaction, and it could be to a legitimate drug, uh, and because they're taking a combination of drugs, they have become confused and they can't remember things. Uh, and actually, if someone looked carefully at the drugs they're taking and limited them, uh, they would not be in this confused state. They may be taking hallucinogenic drugs or other kinds of street drugs, and that's really why they're in this state, and that it's an acute state. Uh, that is, this is someone who may have been well-functioning only a week or two ago, but suddenly they've started experimenting with drugs, they are overwhelmed, and so they're in the emergency room. But you're really dealing, uh, the symptoms you're seeing are really the effects of the drugs. Or you may be seeing someone who has recently developed a brain syndrome of some kind. And, and suddenly they are cognitively dysfunctional. And, and so they're showing all these symptoms that weren't seen before. And so you're trying to sort out as you interview someone uh, in a very gross setting like an emergency room just what set of problems are there and what might be the possibilities and then you have to start ruling out certain things. Now what becomes very helpful is if the person comes with someone else, comes with a loved one, because then you can take some of these premises and often the other person can uh, help you, now, especially if the person say recently has developed some kind of brain syndrome Often, you know, a loved one can tell you, this person was fine until two weeks ago, and then they, they started acting strange. And you, and you can say, well, are they taking any drugs? And they may say, no, this person, I absolutely know this person doesn't experiment with drugs. Well, then you, you may want to very seriously, uh, you know, realize that it's time for a neurologist to see this person, uh, because some of these symptoms really may be organically caused. On the other hand, if they reveal to you that this person has had these symptoms off and on, and last month the person's uh, mother came to visit and stayed a week, and the person got very agitated and, uh, and quit uh, his job right after that, and is feeling very angry, 
then you realize you're probably, and, and the person is delusional, you realize you're probably dealing with a very, you know, chronically troubled person, uh, that all of these symptoms are probably due to a psychological disorder. Now also, uh, and we've, we've touched on this a bit before, but the interview may not necessarily be, the initial interview may not necessarily be because you're trying to examine this person around a problem that you would treat. Uh, one of the obvious ones is if you've been referred a person where they're simply asking you one question, is this person fit to stand trial? Now, if a person had a lot of trouble in just the mental status exam I described, uh, if the person is delusional, uh, they don't know who the president is, uh, they have the very flat affect, they can't keep in contact with you, uh, yet they smile all the time, but the answers you get are bizarre, uh, then you, know, you, you end up having to come to the conclusion that right now, this person could not cooperate with an attorney. If that's the case, of course, then the next thing you have to determine is, is there some intervention that could take place that would help the person to, to be cooperative? Now, when you think about this, you, you have a very uh, you know, complex situation because you would think if someone is confused, delusional, struggling, perhaps very angry, unhappy, that uh, they would be eager to get some assistance from you and not be in such an acute state. However, if getting out of the state means I now have to stand trial for some serious problem, even someone who's pretty disturbed may not be very motivated to get rid of those symptoms. So you, you have to be aware. Uh, and I have seen people, for example, where the person improves, but they, they continue to kind of uh, show some of these symptoms because they know those symptoms will keep them from having to undergo a very negative life experience like going to trial. So sometimes you, you make the assessment and you're very accurate with the, the assessment. You might even be the person who then does some of the intervention, although it's more likely someone else will. Uh, but the person, when you see them the second time, may have improved, but they remember the symptoms that caused you to say that they weren't able to cooperate, and they may show you those symptoms, except that you'll recognize now they're acting, uh, that this isn't really the way they are. I was curious in thinking about uh, interviews. Have any of you ever worked in a crisis clinic? Any of you had any working in a crisis clinic, working in an emergency room, anything like that? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about uh, that now because uh, that's kind of a different situation. At least it, it might differ. It, it, it differs slightly if the person presents in a crisis. The first thing that you usually try to accomplish when a person presents in a crisis is to develop rapport with the person. The, the whole sense that the person is in crisis usually means the person is very anxious. Uh, they may have come and presented themselves as being very anxious or very upset, but it's not uncommon that somebody else has identified that they, they need this help, and so they've been brought in by loved ones. Uh, in some cases, they're brought in by the police who have found them on the street, wandering around, seemingly not able to take care of themselves. And and while I say, you know, the first thing you want to do is establish rapport, uh, obviously in all interviews I've been stressing that you would want to establish rapport with the person uh, that you're working with. But when someone's in a crisis, it, it's especially important. Now, if this person is acutely anxious, delusional, hallucinatory, or if they're profoundly depressed, the, the interviewer usually asks questions that are very gentle. You want to kind of probe just gently at whatever you notice as the major symptom is. But what you don't want to do is to make the person more anxious, or you don't want to get them more depressed so they will withdraw even more. And, uh, and this will come up when we talk about psychotherapy, but there are some things like when people present with delusions, you never attack a delusion. I mean, when the person says, I'm being followed by the FBI, 
you don't say to them, well, don't worry, that really is not true. Terrible clinical mistake. Uh, because often the delusion is giving real meaning to the person's life. The fact that uh, I'm being followed by the FBI means I must be a very important person. I mean, the federal government has you know, assigned people to watch me. Uh, if I'm a person who has no friends, no life, I'm on the streets, uh, if I were to be told that the federal government isn't watching me, that I would be absolutely alone. So I, I like this delusion. And people often do like their delusions. So even though you hear what might be outrageous delusions, you, you don't touch them. They're very important to you because you, you want to listen to what is the delusion? Uh, does the person, are they enhancing of the person? Uh, or are they uh, frightening to the person? But uh, if the person's in crisis, the last thing in the world you would want to do is to say, gee, I have to see how I can remove this delusion. Or to make the, the mistake of thinking, if the person didn't have the delusion, they would feel better. Actually, in many cases, they would feel worse. Now, in crisis situations, uh, you especially want to find out, does the person have any social support? And luckily, if the, if the person actually came in with someone who's a loved one, the information that the person you're interviewing can't provide might be provided by this loved one. So they, they can become a very important person for you, especially if you have some hypothesis. You're sitting there as the interviewer, and you're thinking about some of the ways or some of the things that might be going on with this person, but you're not so sure of your observations. Sometimes a loved one can give you information and fill in things that help you then to understand better uh, exactly who this person is. Because in a crisis situation, normally what you're going to have to do is to decide what kind of treatment is going to take place and when. Now also, one of the problems that, that people face in crisis centers, that's why I asked you, you know, if you'd worked in one, it is amazing how many people don't come back after the first visit. You know, I've just described to you people now who may have very serious problems. I mean, they've gone to the emergency room or they've gone to a crisis intervention center. So the assumption you make is that they are suffering. They are very upset. Troubling things are happening. But because, uh, you know, we, we don't do as good a job as we often need to do in crisis centers, uh, we don't make the person feel safe enough that they come back. And often, by the way, you know, it's ex extremely difficult for the person to get in for this first session. And if you operate in a system in which the person who does the first evaluation is not going to do the treatment, so the person is told they're going to have to come back, and the next time they'll be seeing a stranger uh, who they'll have to say some of these things to again, often that's enough to discourage the person. So in good crisis centers, the person who makes the first contact is the person who is going to see this person at least briefly so that the person gets attached to the center, so that the person feels safe in coming to this place, so they experience some relief from the symptoms that are most troubling to them, because that's what will enable them then to be motivated enough to come back. And if you can't make contact with the patient like this, that is, if you, if you can't form a relationship with the patient and the person is just falling apart, often the only resource that's left to you is you have to hospitalize them. You have to hospitalize them, especially if they're very depressed or very agitated because you're worried they're going to either harm themselves or someone else and you're left without other choices. Okay, in our next uh, session we're going to talk about styles of interviews.